Last week, I made a comment about a movie, and I'm going to kind of go there for a second, but I, I don't want to be the guy that's going to spoil something for you guys. I don't want to spoil the movie. How many here, you've seen the movie um, Avengers Infinity War? Seen that movie? Raise your hand. Yeah. Okay. Some of you have, some of you haven't. Now, if you haven't seen the movie, and you're going to see it, and you don't want me to spoil the ending, you may want to cover your ears for the next two minutes, Okay. Because I don't want you emailing me or slashing my tires because I told you the ending. But I am going to talk about it for a second because it is just important. It's going to lead us into the message. So let, 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 let's go there for a second. Um, superhero movies are kind of predict, predictable, aren't they? they? They are, right? Who wins at the end of a superhero movie? The superhero does, right? The superhero wins every time. So Avengers Infinity War, this is, a, this is a movie where there's a ton of superheroes in it. They keep introducing one after another. And my family and I went opening night. So it was a, it's a different crowd opening night to one of these movies. Like these groupies, they've been waiting for this thing for like two, three years. And I'm like, this is, these people are kind of weird, but I liked it. So I'm hanging out with them. And every time a new superhero comes in, they're like, I mean, the crowd is literally cheering. You know, all of a sudden a new one comes in. They're like, yeah. I'm thinking to myself, my gosh, if we as a church get as excited about Jesus as they did about Thor, my gosh, we will push back the gates of hell. I'm not kidding you. It'll be exciting. Man, it'll be exciting. So we're in this movie, and the, the superheroes are coming in, and all this stuff's happening. At the end of the movie, the superhero swoops in and takes out the bad guy, and, and it was a really climatic moment, and everybody's cheering again and going crazy. And uh, at the very end of the movie, all of a sudden, there was, there was a, a shift. Like, something happened. And all of a sudden, the bad guy wins. And I'm not kidding you. They, they show the end of the movie, and the bad guy's standing there, or sitting there, and he's got this smirk on his face. And just when you're thinking, okay, well, well now Iron Man's going to come in and take him out. Spider-Man's going to come in and do his thing. Their Iron Man don't show up. And Spider-Man don't show up. And all of a sudden, boom, the credits start rolling. And, I mean, you could have heard a pin drop in this place. I mean, I'm looking around. People are, like, bawling. And I'm like, my gosh. I'm like, you do understand this isn't real, right? I mean, I don't know if they understood that. I'm like, people are emotional. And I, everything in your pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm watching. I'm like, here's me. I'm like, yes, that's awesome. I'm like, like cheering on. And even my son Jake is like, Dad. I'm like, Jake, I'm sorry. Dad kind of likes when the bad guy wins once in a while. I'm a little twisted that way. And I was kind of like excited. Like we were driving home, and this was my thought. Right? I'll, sometimes I shouldn't say these things, but I'll tell you. I was driving home, and I said to the kids, I said, you know what we should do? Because that was awesome. I said, here's what we should do. Tomorrow we should go to the same movie because we know how it's going to end. And we go to it, and it'll be the same crowd all cheered up or different people, but all, whatever. And when the, when, when the bad guy wins at the end, we stand up and we're like, yes, yes. And we just start going crazy. That would be funny to me. But, but these, people are, these people are hardcore. And I'm afraid, A, they'd kill me, right? B, the other thing is, B, I'm cheap. So for me to pay for the same movie two nights in a row, I mean, it's not going to happen. So we didn't do it for those reasons, but I, I, I'm not kidding you. It was, there's something about an ending not going like you think it's going to go. I mean, these people are like, it, it, it's over? And they're waiting and waiting for something to happen, and nothing ever happened. It was done. And some of you, let's be real candid today. Some of you are in an area of your life where the movie seems over. The credits are rolling, and you're thinking, this is not the story I would have written. This isn't the movie script. This isn't how it was supposed to play out. And you're thinking to yourself, how did, how did I get where I am? Why is it like this? We're in a bad ending. Some of you parents know this, right? You got the boomerang kids. You know what a boomerang kid is, right? The boomerang kid is a kid that you send out at 18, and all of a sudden, beep, they end up back at your place at like 22. Now they're in your basement like playing Fortnite like it's a full-time job. I mean, no, that's a bad ending. That's a bad ending. Some of you guys, right, you find that perfect girl and she seems nice. You finally found the one. She seems normal. And after three months, all of a sudden, after three months, I tell people, date at least three months, the true colors will start coming out. And all of a sudden, the true colors start coming out. She seems a little bit Maybe not normal. And she starts to get possessive. And she starts to like, ask a lot of questions. Where are you going? What are you doing? And she's tracking you on your phone. And she's checking your texts. And you're like, she's calling you. And she's like, hey, where are you, baby, where are you at? And you're like, I'm at church. She's like, put Jesus on the phone. You're like, put what? Just put Jesus on the phone. Yeah, that's going to that's gonna end bad. That is going to end bad. But God has got something for us. Yes, we are going to get to scriptures today. Believe it or not, we are. Genesis, the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 40. If you brought a Bible or a mobile device, go to Genesis chapter 40. And if you don't have that, it's cool. We're going to put it on the screen. But, but know this, Genesis is the first book of the Bible. Literally means 
beginning. That's why it's pretty obvious. But Genesis, I got to backtrack a little bit. If you weren't here last week, I'm going to fill you in a little bit. Um, and if you ever miss a message, check it out on YouTube or our, or our website. But, um, and if you're new, man, I'm glad you're here. Boy, you are, you are in for something. God has got something incredible in store for us today. Genesis chapter 40, Joseph, this isn't the Joseph, Mary and Joseph, the guy in the New Testament. This is a different Joseph in the Old Testament. Old Testament's before Jesus came to earth. New Testament's after Jesus came to earth. It, way, back, way back in the early days, uh, Jacob, a guy had, Jacob had 12 sons, and Joseph was the youngest. And last week, we learned that Joseph had these dreams, and these aspir- literally these dreams, right? Dream on. And these dreams, we're talking about, he's going to do these great things, and people are going to bow down, he's going to be a ruler. Well, that's not how his story is ending. We ended last week with him not being a ruler, but him being a slave. We ended last week with Joseph literally being in chains, sold by his brothers to a slave trader, basically left for dead. So Joseph's thinking, wait a second, this isn't the movie that I signed up for. This isn't the dream that God gave me. But this is, this is what's happening right now. This is what's going on right now in Joseph's life. And so here's where we pick it up. We pick it up today. Joseph's been sold to slavery. Now he's in prison. He's actually been, it's, it's, gone, it's gone from bad to worse. Joseph has been uh, accused of something he didn't do. So now he's in prison in Egypt. And the guy in charge of Egypt, uh, he's called Pharaoh. Now, Pharaoh is in his name. It's his title, like president. Pharaoh, there's different pharaohs throughout the Bible. And this pharaoh, um, the king of Egypt, he, uh, he threw a couple other guys in prison with Joseph. Two of his right-hand men actually are in prison. The, his baker, obviously the guy that bakes his food, and his cupbearer. His, so his cupbearer is in prison too. I don't know what they did, doesn't say. But his cupbearer, that's the guy that drinks anything before the, the pharaoh drinks it or eats anything before the pharaoh eats it to make sure that it's not poisonous, right? This is kind of like my role in, in my family. Like when we go out for ice cream, I'm like, this is serious, kids. Give me a bite of everything you've got right now because dad needs to test it. I got to make sure. And they're like, dad, I'm, just, I'm not kidding. I am the good shepherd. I laid on my life for my my sheep. Now hand over the blizzard, okay? So that's what I do. And uh, so that's what he's doing. So, so these guys are in prison with Joseph. This is where we pick up the story in, in Genesis 40, verse 5. While they were in prison all together, Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker each had a dream. Here we go with the dreaming. One night they had a dream, and each dream had its own meaning. When Joseph saw them the next morning, he noticed they both looked upset. That is key. I'll come back to that. Why do you guys look so worried, Joseph said. He asked them. And they replied, well, we both had a dream last night, and, uh, but no one could tell us what those dreams meant that we had. Joseph says something uh, very compelling. He says, interpreting dreams is God's business. That's key. We didn't hear that last week. Joseph replied, interpreting dreams is God's business. He said, go ahead and tell me what, what, what they said. Go ahead and tell me what your dream was. So I got to pause for a second. A couple things you need to know about this. Number one, Joseph, if you were with us last week, Joseph was very self-centered, very about him, very about his dreams. And I'm going to be this and you're going to be that and I'm all this. Well, this is different. Now Joseph is noticing other people. That's what, that's what it said. It said Joseph noticed them. It means he was looking at them. It means he cared about them. He noticed that even the look on their face was a look of worry. So he speaks into it, says, hey, what's going on? This isn't the Joseph that we learned about before. But God's doing something. Something's going on. And then he gives God the credit for the dream, for for the interpretation of the dream. We didn't hear that before about Joseph's dream. It was all about, well, Joseph's going to be this, and you're going to be that. It wasn't that. So Joseph's giving God the credit for it. Something's happening. Right? There's, there's, like a, there's like a shift that is taking place right now, early on in the scriptures. Repeat after me. Shift happens. It does. It does. That's the title of today's message. And some of you, you're in the middle of a shift. And that's not a bad thing. But even though you're in the middle of it, again, embrace where you're at. Because if you're shifting, that means you're moving. That means God is doing something. Joseph was in chains and in prison. And he could look up and say, there are all the credits. It's over. But what if God is saying today to Joseph and to me and to you that the story isn't over, that it's only intermission, and that God is just getting started to do something incredible in your life? It's just intermission, right? Avenger fans, don't worry. They'll make another one. It's going to be all right. It's going to be okay, all right? It's going to be okay. So 
let's, let's keep going. So in verse 9, so the chief cupbearer tells Joseph his dream first. And he says, here's what went down when I was sleeping. In my dream, I saw a grapevine, a grapevine in front of me. The vine had three branches that began to bud and blossom. And soon it produced a nice ripe cluster of grapes. I was holding Pharaoh's wine cup in my hand, and I took the cluster of grapes and squeezed it into the cup, and then I gave it to Pharaoh. That's it. Joseph says, this is what your dream means. This is what God told me. The three branches, they represent three days. Say three days. Three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift you up, restore you to a position as the chief cup bearer. That sounds like good news to the, to the cup bearer. That sounds like great news. But listen to what Joseph says next. Joseph says, please remember me and do me a favor. When these things go well for you, mention me to Pharaoh so he might let me out of this place. For I was kidnapped from my homeland, the land of the Hebrews, and now I'm here in prison. I did nothing to deserve it. Those things are all true. Joseph, the, everything he just said is all true. He's like, dude, when you get out in three days, remember me. Let's, let's like Shawshank Redemption out of this place because I've been here long enough. I can't do it anymore. But, but, and, and we could look at that and say, Joseph's not really trusting God, and really he's not. He's starting to put his trust back in the cupbearer. But can you blame him? He's been in prison. He's been in slavery. And he's saying, you know what, God? You're not doing it on my timetable, so now i got to rely on the cupbearer to do it for me. Some of you, you walked into this place and you're doubting and you're struggling and there are things going on in your life that you don't understand. Like Joseph didn't get it. This guy's getting out, but I'm stuck here. I'm telling you, it's intermission. Don't you give up. Lean in. Watch what God does here. This is so key that we catch this. Let's keep reading. So, Back to the dreams. The cupbearer just had his dream revealed. Now it's, now it's the baker's turn. So the chief baker saw that Joseph had given the first dream such a positive interpretation. He says to Joseph, me, 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 me. It's my turn. It's, it's my turn. I want some of that. I had a dream. I had a dream too. My dream was there were three baskets of pastries stacked on my head. The top basket contains all kinds of Krispy Kremes for the Pharaoh. They look so good. But the birds came and ate them from the basket on my head. And Joseph's like, okay, all right, weird, but I'll see. This is what your dream means, Joseph said. The three baskets, they represent three days. Say three days. Okay, this is going good. They represent three days. Three days from now, Baker, Pharaoh will lift you up. He's like, yes, yes. Pharaoh will cut off your head, impale your body on a pole, and the birds will come and peck away your flesh. He's like, yeah, wait, what? What? That isn't, that ain't right. What about his dream? I want that dream. I don't want this dream. You ever wanted a second opinion on something? I mean, I, you know what? I, he wanted a second opinion. When I was in my early 20s, I was getting stomach pain like every six months really bad. So I go to the doctor and they say, you know what? They put me in an MRI machine and uh, that was scary enough. And they diagnosed me with a kidney stone. And then the doctor, doctor's like, all right, you got a kidney stone. You know, this is what it looks like and this is what we need to do. I'm like, yeah, cool. I just got to drink something, break it up or whatever and whatever does this thing. He's like, no, 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 no. He says, no, we, we, we got to go up and get it. And I said, what do you mean go up and get it? <laughs> you're, you're, you lost me for a second. And he starts to describe in detail something I can't describe for you in detail, but I will tell you that he, he said, we're, we're going to take this tool and we're going to go up. And guys, if you're not cringing, you should be. Because he says, we're going to go up this thing. And, and we're going to, he says, we're just going to, and this is what he says, we're just going to dig. We're just going to dig it right out of there. And I'm like, oh, is that what you're going to do? You're just going to dig it right out of there? Yeah, you bet. That sounds great. Let's just dig it right out of there. I'm like, are you crazy? I want a second opinion. In fact, you know what? I don't need a second opinion. I have just been healed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm good. Where, where, where is my jeans? I'm getting the heck out of here. That's what he told me. And this is what they did. I go in for surgery. They do this sadistic surgery on me. I get done. I'm all jacked up on drugs, laying on the bed. And, and, and all of a sudden, my blurry vision is starting to come to. And I see the doctor standing right over me in post-op. And I'm like, all I can say is, did you get it? Did you get it? He goes, no. He goes, it turns out you didn't have one. I'm like, I will kill you. I, what is wrong with you? I, I wanted a second opinion. That is, a, that is a sadly true story. That's what happened. Oh, my gosh. God's amazing. Um, so back to the scriptures. He wanted a second opinion. Unfortunately for the Mr. Krispy Kreme, the interpretation came true. 
Fortunately for the cupbearer, it came true. Joseph sees these things go down in three days. Those guys get out. One guy good, one guy bad. And Joseph, but, but think about Joseph as he sees what's happening. God's doing something in Joseph. God is showing Joseph, Joseph, my hand is on you. Like, Joseph, I, I have given you a gift. And Joseph is starting to see, my gosh, I did interpret the dreams. But it wasn't Joseph's knowledge. It wasn't his knowledge of the dreams that helped him interpret them. It was his knowledge of God. It wasn't the knowledge of the dreams. It was his knowledge of God. See, the closer that you and I get to God, through his word, uh, through his church, through his people, the closer that we get to God, the more that we trust God and know that his plans are better than anything that we can dream or imagine in our life. You just got to get closer to him. You just got to trust his promises. You just got to know what he says. God gave Joseph the ability to do that. And it was amazing, but never put the fate of your dreams in someone's hands. Only put it in God's hands. Don't trust people to do what only God can do, okay? Do not do that. It's a mistake that we all are guilty of making sometimes. Joseph couldn't trust the cupbearer. Do you know why? As soon as the cupbearer was out in three days, guess what? He didn't speak a word about Joseph. He didn't, he didn't tell Pharaoh anything about Joseph. Nothing. Nothing. Tells him nothing. And here's Joseph in the prison. Don't put your hope in people, or Joseph. Put it in God. Genesis 41. Now we're going to go from 40 to 41. Genesis 41, verse 1. We pick it up. In my translation that I'm reading, listen to what it says, the first four words. Two full years later. I like full. I mean, it's really making a point here. Two, trust me, Joseph felt every one of those, those two years. Two full years later. Pharaoh is now having a dream, okay? Now it's moved from Joseph to the cupbearer to the baker. Now Pharaoh, dream on Pharaoh, dream on. Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing on the bank of the Nile River. In his dream, he saw seven fat, healthy cows come up out of the river and begin grazing in the marsh grass. Seems pretty normal. Then he saw seven more cows come up behind the big cows, the healthy cows from the Nile. But these seven other cows, they were scrawny, and, and, they, and they were thin. I mean, some scholars believe they were on a keto diet. I wasn't able to confirm that, but that's what they think. So um, these cows stood beside the fat cows on the riverbank. This is his dream. Then, this is where it gets a little bit weird. Then the scrawny cows, this is what diets will do, though. This is what a diet will do. Then the scrawny cows ate the seven healthy cows. It makes you binge, right? You quit eating, and then all of a sudden you're, you're in the refrigerator at three in the morning. So they, they, the seven scrawny ones eat the seven fat ones, and then Pharaoh wakes up. He's like, what? The, what, what does that mean? But it gets, it, it, say it gets weirder. It gets weirder. It gets weirder. Is weirder a word? It gets more weird? Whatever. So, okay, here he goes. But he fell asleep again, and Pharaoh has another dream. This time, and it's going to sound familiar, he, he saw seven heads of grain, plump and beautiful, growing on a single stalk. The seven, then he saw seven more heads of grain appeared, but they were shriveled and withered by the east wind. You know where this is going. The, the, the thin heads swallowed up the seven plump, well-formed heads, and Pharaoh wakes up again and realizes it was a dream. Say, that's weird. That's weird, just like the first dream, Pharaoh. Pharaoh was even disturbed by it. He's like, I don't get what, what's going on here. It, the, it says the next morning, Pharaoh was very disturbed, as he should have been, by the dreams. So he called for magicians, and he called for wise men from Egypt to help him. When Pharaoh told them the dreams, though, guess what? Not one of them could tell him what they meant. Again, never trust people to do what only God can do, okay? These guys had no clue what the dreams meant, but somebody did. Check it out. Verse 9, finally, the king's, the king's chief cupbearer speaks up. Wow, better late than never, I guess. He says, today, I've been reminded of my failure, Pharaoh. Some time ago, say two years, two years, you were angry with me and the baker, remember Mr. Krispy Kreme, and you imprisoned us in a palace of the captain of the guard. One night, the baker and I each had a dream, and each dream had its own meaning. There was a young Hebrew man in there with us who was a slave of the captain of the guard. This guy told us what the dreams meant. 
And he told, us what each, he told us what each one meant. And everything he said happened as predicted. I was restored to my position as cupbearer. And the other guy, well, you killed him, right? He's dead. But it went just like the guy said. This is, this is amazing because you think about the cupbearer all of a sudden coming up with this and thinking, gosh, after two years, he finally remembers what, 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 what Joseph wanted him to remember. But what you need to know is this. It really wasn't even the cupbearer remembering it. It was God orchestrating the entire time. So God is moving and working in Joseph's life. And I'll guarantee after about year one in prison, Joseph was thinking, God, if you're even real, I don't even know it because I don't know where you are. And some of you, you're in the same position. Two years has gone by, and God is moving the entire time. It's not like he's sitting there not caring. He loves you. He's working on your life. I think so many people, I believe so many people will give up on their dream before it has a, you have a chance to realize it. Okay, so many people will give up on a dream because it's not happening according to our schedule. I can, I've been guilty of this, and maybe you have too. But I will tell you, if you're, in, if you're in that area right now or that arena, listen to me. A waiting season is never a wasted season if you're trusting God. Okay? A waiting season is never a wasted season if you're trusting God. Some of you, you're in that season of your life and you don't understand it and you don't get it. And you've been waiting and you've been wondering. And I'm here to tell you, I'm here to encourage you, don't you give up. Don't you give in, right? Stop focusing on what hasn't happened yet and start believing that with God, all things are possible because they are. He's moving. He's moving. Tell your neighbor he's moving. She needs to know he's moving. She's got to know it. He's got to know it. God is moving, especially when you don't think he's moving. Don't give up on your dream. Don't give up on your desire. Joseph didn't give up, and look what happens. Here we go. Here we go. Pharaoh sends for Joseph. The guy that you're telling me about, about the dreams, I want to meet him. Pharaoh sends for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the prison. I love this part. He shaved, put on a new pair of clothes, which is very courteous, and then he went in and stood before, before Pharaoh. Verse 15. When Pharaoh, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream last night. I had a couple of them. No one here can tell me what they meant, but I have heard that when you hear about a dream, Joseph, you can interpret it. And Joseph's like, you don't like Krispy Kremes, do you? I'm just kidding, didn't say that. But um, Joseph's like, um, yeah, I can't do it, but God can. It's basically what he said. Look at verse 16. It is beyond my power to do this. Again, Joseph taking the focus from him, a shift is happening, and he's putting it on God. It's beyond my power to do this, Joseph replied, but God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. Joseph goes on to describe to Pharaoh what the dreams meant. You know what they meant? It's crazy. The fat cows, the seven fat cows, seven years of, uh, seven years of incredible um, pros prosperity in the land, growth in the land, crops are going to be great, people are going to do great. It's going to be seven abundant years. But after the seven years, Joseph tells Pharaoh, seven bad years are coming. The scrawny cows are going to come. And not only are seven bad years coming after the first seven good years, the seven bad years will be so bad that they will completely wipe out the seven good years. This is what's going to happen. And Joseph was right on because God's hand was on Joseph. And Pharaoh listened to this, and Pharaoh believed it, because this guy, everything he said has come true so far. So Pharaoh believed it, and Joseph said, you know what, if I could give you any advice, this is what I'm telling you, because this is going to go down. You need, to, you need someone in charge that can, like, manage these next 14 years so you don't lose it all, and people die of famine and starvation. And Pharaoh's like, that's a good point. So Pharaoh does this. You will see, I'll, I'll, I'll skip to Genesis 41, Verses 40 and 41. Joseph describes all that's going to happen in the next 14 years. And Pharaoh says this. You'll be in charge. Points to Joseph. You'll be in charge of my court. You'll be in charge of my people. They're going to take orders from you. Only I sitting on the throne will have a higher rank than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge. A Hebrew in charge of Egypt. Only God can do something like this. He puts him in charge of the entire land of Egypt. And Joseph does an incredible job navigating for the next 14 years. And it's amazing. They're not all wiped out. 
because God's hand is on Joseph, but he manages it. They store up, they stock up, and they're good beyond the seven years. Not only does that happen, but I'll take you from Genesis 40 to Genesis 50. By the way, you should, man, 10 minutes a day in God's world will change your life. This week, read from 40 to 50 Genesis. You'll be amazed. It's like straight out of a Quentin Tarantino movie. It's so weird and crazy, but what God is doing in it, it only God can do. Basically, there's that 14 years. You know what else happened? God would reunite uh, Joseph with all of his brothers. The brothers that sold him to slavery, the brothers that left him for, for dead, God, God would put them back together. Not only that, but God would bring Jacob, the dad, back into a relationship with Joseph. So all this is going down. And, 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 we, and we think about, okay, Joseph's forgiven his brothers for wanting to kill him. He's, he's forgiven his dad for anything that they had. And it's like, this is an amazing story. Basically, Joseph's dreams are coming true. And you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. All Joseph's dreams didn't come true. Remember, Joseph had a dream that he would rise up and his brothers would follow. Say, keep reading. We got to keep reading. Okay. Genesis 50. You got to read 40 to 50 this weekend. I promise you won't regret it. It's the weirdest but most beautiful story. Genesis 50, verse 18 let me fill you in. What's happened now is the brothers are in a relationship again. Joseph's actually saved the brother's life. They were dying of famine, seven bad years. They went to Egypt because they were going to die. Their families are going to die. They had no idea that their brother was in charge of Egypt. None. God knew. God knew, just like he knows what's going on in your life and cares about every bit of it. His brothers show up. I can't go through all the details, but they're reunited. Jacob has now died. Dad has died. Brothers are still kind of freaking out. They were mean to Joseph. And they're thinking, Dad's gone now. Joseph, maybe there's still some tension unresolved. And he says, and, and they're freaking out. And it says in Genesis 50, then his brothers came because they're worried. And they bowed low before their brother Joseph. Well, that was the dream from last week. That came true. It says, look, we're all your slaves, Joseph, they said. And look at Joseph's reply. Don't be afraid of me. Am I God? That I can punish you? You intended to harm me. But God, say but God. But God intended it all for good. Joseph's dream is realized. But his dream is only realized when Joseph finally took his focus off of his dream and put it on somebody else's. Do you see that? Shift happens. A shift took place in Joseph's life. And this is your main point. This is it. When you help others live out their dream, you will live out your dream. Right. It's not about you, but then it's all about you. It's, 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 this, is the, this is the dynamic of Christianity that most people didn't get. I didn't get it. Oh my gosh, if anybody didn't get it, your pastor didn't get it. 11 years clean from drugs, but 11 years ago, horrible, horrible situation. I mean, disgustingly horrible situation. This, I thought, I thank you, God, that wasn't the end of the story. But I'm telling you what, anybody here that struggles from addiction or you know somebody that does, and I'm not just talking drugs, I'm talking life. And you struggle, you will know something that, that when someone's consumed with something, it turns them into somebody they're not, and it will turn, turn them inward so quick you can't believe it. It will be all about them. It's what it does. It was all about me. I, didn't, I started to care less about everybody, including my family. It just isolates and isolates until it kills you. It's what it was doing in my life. It was literally tearing me down. And God brought me to a point 11 years ago, went to rehab, and I'll never forget it. In rehab, if it's a good rehab, they'll teach you that one of the best ways to get out of your addiction is to get out of you. It's so hard when you're in it, though. But once you start to see the light, you start to realize, and God will do something and show you, you know what? You start to realize your, 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 your family and your friends who love you and wrap around you, who never leave your side, they're there for you. And you start, to, you start to realize that it's not even about my dream, it's about their dream. And when I help them with their dream, I get to live out my dream. It's the craziest dynamic shift happens. A shift was happening. And when I, when I really realized it is the day that I came home from rehab the second time. I'll never forget it. I've shared it once before, but I'll share it again. 
I get home from drug rehab, 30 day rehab the second time, and I walk through the doors of my house and I'm, you gotta understand, I'm struggling, I'm hurting, I'm still just, I'm, I've, I've hurt a lot of people, it's still very tense. And I walk into my door and my daughter, Ava's 13, but she was two. So Ava's dressed in this beautiful white gown and I'll just never forget it. It was, it was I, I stepped over the, the door into the house and I look up the stairs and there's Ava, and she hasn't seen her dad in 30 days. She has no idea where I've been or what's been going on. She don't get it. But she, but she knows she's dressed up for a reason, because we dress up for a celebration, right? We dress up for a party, right? So she's dressed up, but she don't really get why. She knows daddy's coming home. So she's up there, and I, I, I literally step in, and I walk in, and I'm just, I'm already just broken. And God was still breaking me. And I look up at Ava, and this is what happens. I kid you not. She looks at me, and she has these big blue eyes, if you've ever seen her. And they got bigger, and they got bluer. And she looked at me, and she goes, Daddy. And I look at her, and I say, hey, sweetie. She goes, and she kept saying, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And she couldn't contain herself. Pretty soon, she started spinning around. She goes, Daddy, 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 Daddy. And she kept spinning and kept spinning and kept spinning. And I said, Ava, Ava, Ava. And in that moment, God was showing me something. He's like, it isn't about me and my dream. God loves me. But he says, when you get out of yourself and you start to help people realize their dreams and that they matter, God will do something in your life. Drug addiction, it was never something I would wish on anybody. That was never, that is, I didn't want that. I didn't want that. But, but, but think about this. Sometimes you've got to go through something difficult in order to really appreciate the dream, don't you? Some of you know what I'm talking about because you're in it or you've been through it. You're in the middle of the shift. You're in the middle of it. But sometimes you've got to go through something difficult in order to see the dream. Joseph, look at Joseph. Joseph. Joseph had to be faithful in a prison before he could be put in charge of a palace. David had to herd sheep before he could take down a giant. Jesus Christ would have to take nails in his hands and his feet and die on a cross for you and I to be saved from our sins. I'm telling somebody what the devil meant for evil, God is using for good in this place. Give him a shout. Does anybody believe it? I believe it, God, because I'm seeing it right before my eyes. Your Father loves you. Your father's not done with you. This is good news. You know what's even crazier in this story? As I close out, I'll tell you this. Joseph's life is foreshadowing somebody else's life. Remember that guy I just talked about? He got nailed to a cross. His name is Jesus. There's some comparisons. There's some similarities. I just got to make sure you catch them. Joseph and Jesus, both beloved by their father. Joseph and Jesus, both obedient to the will of their father. Joseph and Jesus, both hated and rejected by their family. Joseph and Jesus, both sold as a slave for pieces of silver. Joseph and Jesus, falsely accused and unjustly punished. Joseph and Jesus, both stripped of their robes and bound in chains. Joseph and Jesus both placed with two other prisoners, one that would go free and one that would die eternally. Joseph and Jesus finally elevated to a place of suffering, to a powerful throne, the saving people from death. Joseph and Jesus lived their purpose, both of them. Why? Because they focused on others. When we get the focus from here to here, and it goes up there, he gets all the glory, and lives are changed. This is what, this is what God wants to do. Jesus Christ came for you and me. Joseph died and he's in heaven today but Jesus died and rose three days later defeating sin defeating death so you and I might have a chance to live out our dream so God brought you here today so you could hear that your father in heaven isn't mad at you he, he, he's not upset with you he loves you he's pursuing you today that's why you're here and he sent Jesus why because Jesus, if anybody lived an other, other focused life, it was Jesus. It was all about other people all the time. God never did nothing for him. And he's teaching us, when you focus on the dreams of others, you will live out your dream. 
Jesus died and rose to defeat sin and death. And what I need you to understand in this moment is this. The gospel says anybody who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. And you will pass from death to life. Not, not by rules, not by religion, but, but through a relationship with the Son to get through the Father. And for some of you, you're not going to leave here until you pray with somebody and say, I want that. I want that life. I want the dream-filled life now and forever. And you can have it. Doesn't mean it's easy. Doesn't mean you're not going to struggle. Just look at Joseph. It does mean you will live a dream-filled life. It does mean you will focus a lot more on others. You won't always get it right. I'm still one of the most selfish people I know, unfortunately. But God's working on me. And he wants to work on you. For the person here that's struggling or hurting, your father says to you today, I love you. I want to heal you. And I want to make you new. So in closing, I'm going to pray for you. And then we're going to sing and celebrate what God is doing in this place. And um, afterwards, there's a table back there that says life groups. Life groups are just our small groups of the church. And I'm, I, I'm, we're encouraging them because it's where you do life together. And, and, and sometimes people will say, well, I don't need a life group because I've already got people in the world and I've already got people this. What if I told you, what if it's not about you? What if you're supposed to focus on the needs of others to live out your dream? What if there's somebody who's in a life group now who's waiting for you to join one so that you can pour into them? We gotta shift our mind. A shift has to happen. It's gotta stop being about us. And when it starts being about others, it will be about you. You'll see that. It's how God works. So if you're not in a group, I pray that you'll go back there and just talk to Kendra, talk to Mindy, talk to someone back there. It, it, it's, it's where life happens. This is awesome on Sunday, and I'll do it till the day I die. But unless we take a next step and get closer to people where we can get vulnerable and open up and start to heal and start to learn more about God and his love for us, we're just showing up for church. And that's not a bad thing, but it can't be the only thing. It can't be the only thing. God has so much more for you. God has so much more for you. Do you see? He has so much more for Joseph, so much more for his life. God, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you so much for your spirit in this place today, for your word and your truth. It is crazy. The dysfunction of these families, God, it makes my family look normal. And that's saying something because I've got issues. We've got problems. But yet I see through the dysfunction from thousands of years ago, you still worked out dreams and the dysfunctions. How do you do it? How are you so good to us? When we stray, when we do things we shouldn't do, look at things we shouldn't look at, say things we shouldn't say, treat people the way we shouldn't treat them. God, for all those offenses, we say we are sorry. We're asking you to change our heart, to make us new. I want to live different. And I believe everybody in this place, they want to live different. They want to be a better version of the, of the way they are right now. I believe it for every person. But, I, but I'm convinced through your word and your truth that for that to happen, we have to step away from our focus so we can focus on somebody else. Because if we'll focus on somebody else, God, you will put your focus on us and doing things for us that we could never dream or imagine. God, for anybody that needs to surrender to you, to, to recommit to you, whatever, whatever you want them to do, God, I pray they're obedient and they do it. I pray that after service, God, after we pray and we're with people, I pray that the life group table is flooded with people just saying, hey, what's it about? What's it mean? What does it look like? Just asking questions because they want change. They want something different because if nothing changes, nothing changes. And you brought us here to change us. You brought us here to make us new. You brought us here to do something that only you can do, Father. We love you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, dying on a cross for us, rising from the dead for us to defeat sin and defeat death so we might live an abundant life now, today, tomorrow, and forever. We love you. We give you glory. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody says, amen. Hey, wherever you are, thanks so much for joining us today. We are so glad that you did. And if this blessed you in any way, man, we would love for you to subscribe to this channel, follow us on social media, and stay connected with us. And let me say most importantly, if you are ready to give your life to Christ or you want to make a decision for Jesus today, we would love it, man. Connect with us. Contact us at hello at meadows.church. Again, hello at meadows.church. Let us know what God is doing in your life. And know this, God loves you and the best is truly yet to come.